Hey, do you like books? No? How about audiobooks? You can at least do audiobooks, right? I've been trying to do more reading, reading recently, and as part of that I decided on a whim to get into Star Wars The High Republic, and it's been an unexpectedly delightful experience, one which I would now like to share with you. If you have no idea what that is, let me try and explain. Star Wars The High Republic is a multimedia project launched in 2021 encompassing novels, comic books, manga, audio dramas, and eventually video games. It's set in the Star Wars universe roughly 200 years before the films and covers an era when the good guys are well and truly winning. The Sith are gone, the Jedi and the Republic are flourishing, and the whole project is just telling stories within this setting. Outside of a few references in the new Star Wars comics, the High Republic is kind of its own little bubble of Star Wars content, totally separate from any of the shows or movies Disney's making right now. That bubble has made it kind of obscure, not that a collection of novels and comic books is ever going to be as popular as a Disney Plus show, but that disconnection makes it easily ignored by even hardcore Star Wars fans, and I think that's actually to its benefit. In this video, I'm going to try and convince you to read books. I'm sure this video will get all the views. Talking about the High Republic is a little bit tricky because it's not really a story per se, it's not like the Skywalker Saga, which is theoretically a connected series of films. The High Republic is a setting, it's more like the MCU. There's lots of disconnected stories within the scope of High Republic, some of which is critically important and some of which is entirely superfluous. The key thing to get across is that it's all new. No Skywalkers, no Palpatines, no R2D2s or C3PO's. Basically, it's everything the sequel trilogy isn't. It's finally something different. Let's start by giving a taster. I'll focus most of my discussion on the first few books and keep it broad to avoid spoilers. The first book and the best place to start High Republic is Light of the Jedi, a very generic name for a unique book. Here's the setup. A transport ship crashes while in hyperspace. The ship breaks apart, sending fragments of the ship randomly hurling through space at light speed. And if you've seen The Last Jedi, you know that's not good. The first wave of fragments starts coming down in the Hetzal system, and the first half of the book plays out like a disaster movie, as the Jedi and local governments try to figure out what's going on, how to save the people, and how to stop this disaster. The book cuts between several different stories of different people and their efforts to avert this catastrophe. There's Bel Zetifar and his master Loden Great Storm trying to save refugees. There's Avar Chris and the Jedi leadership in space trying to get communications working. There's the Minister of Hetzel trying to organise an evacuation and prevent a widespread panic. And there's another group of Jedi in space trying to rescue survivors on board fragments of the crashing transport alongside some helpful civilians. The book throws a lot of names at you, but this structure of separate stories within the larger narrative keeps things clear in your head. Star Wars loves destroying planets, it happens all the time, but what makes this book distinct is the speed at which the planet is being destroyed, and the lack of a direct villain to fight, at least on the surface. There's not a big laser for the good guys to blow up, there's just dealing with the fallout of an unexpected disaster. The disaster, however, is no mere accident, it's the first move in a game being played by one of the best villains in all of Star Wars, Martian Ro, or Marcion Ro, the pronunciation is inconsistent. Martian Ro is the Eye of the Nihil, a group of part space pirate, part viking raiders who operate in the outer reaches of space, and they are the primary antagonists of the High Republic era. The Republic is in an age of peace, security, and rapid expansion, including expansion into the Outer Rim, where the Nihil operate, and the Nihil have started a resistance to their expansion by raiding them. They don't have the raw strength of the Republic, but they still hold many advantages over them. They attack using gas that incapacitates any who breathe it in, and more importantly, they have access to the paths, hidden routes through hyperspace that allow them to appear and disappear without warning. As a side note, this book actually clarified for me how hyperspace works works. Basically in Star Wars, hyperspace is this universe's way of faster than light travel, but because if you crash into something at high speeds you could cause a major accident, you can only travel through very specific routes called hyperlanes that have been mapped out. That's why in the movies, before they jump to hyperspace, they need to wait until a safe route has been calculated. Anyway, the Nihil have access to secret, more dangerous routes that allow 
allow them to engage in hit and run tactics with great efficiency. Most critically of all for the Republic is that the Nihil have Martian Ro. Martian Ro is part Thrawn, part Kylo Ren. He's young and angsty, but also incredibly intelligent and a brilliant tactician. Within the Nihil power structure, he isn't exactly the leader, but over the course of the novel, he arranges things so that he is in charge by default. The Nihil, as a semi organised band of raiders, have an extremely fragile alliance. They use storm imagery, where there are three primary factions called Tempests, each led by a Tempest runner. Each of them get a vote on where the Nihil will raid and when with a final veto vote going to the Eye, who doesn't lead anyone but does have access to the paths, the Nihil's secret weapon and best defence. It's a tense situation because nobody likes Ro, they'd all kill him if they thought they could get away with it, but they need him and he needs them too. Ro is just a character with so much going on, his schemes to lead the Nihil, his complicated relationship with the man who preceded him, his father, who he suspects was murdered and wants to avenge, but also who he hated, his vendetta against the Jedi specifically for unknown reasons, his mysterious race and people's history and his adversarial relationship with the Tempest Runners. It was him that arranged the crash at the start of the book by sending a Nihil ship to park right in front of the transport, his opening move in both devastating the Republic and gaining power within the Nihil. Martian Ro is just a much more dynamic villain than the vast majority of villains in Star Wars proper. As much as I love old Palpy, his motivation has never been anything more than I'm so evil that I will corrupt all to the dark side. <laughs> Which is fine, but it gets old after a while. The Nihil are pretty evil, sure, but they're not evil evil because they're fueled by dark magic. They're fueled by greed and resentment for the hoity-toity Republic who think they're so much better than them. They're more dynamic villains than the Empire. They're technically the underdogs and so they have to fight a lot smarter in order to be a genuine threat. Of course, a villain is only as good as the heroes they fight, and the High Republic also has some excellent good guys on offer. Most, but not all, of the heroes in these books are Jedi. However, the writers understand that a perfect Jedi is pretty boring. A perfect Jedi is essentially an emotionless monk with no internal or external conflict. A lot of the Jedi stories in this era are about the character's relationship with the strict Jedi code, how they feel about it, how they're breaking it in their own unique ways, or how that strict code is affecting their life. And and their mental health. This is an era where the Jedi are at the peak of their power, but it's also an era that's highly sceptical of that power. Avar Chris, for example, that's this Jodie Whittaker looking lady on the cover. She's initially introduced as a kind of ultimate Jedi example. She's peaceful, respectful, highly spiritual and in tune with the Force. She has a unique ability to sense others in the Force which she perceives as music, with each individual their own unique melody. However, as we learn more about her over the the course of the separate books and comics, we get a clearer understanding of her. She has the capacity for rage like anyone, and more importantly, she shares a complicated semi-romantic relationship with fellow Jedi Elzar Man, one that they're both too noble to act upon even if they want to, which is another thing these books have that modern Star Wars has been sorely missing, some bloody romance. There's a certain tragedy to the Jedi that these books understand. Their code forces them to suppress themselves, to skip important life experiences. And one thing these books are really good at demonstrating is how badly the Jedi Code prepares them to deal with grief. Without spoiling too much, a whole lot of Jedi Masters die in these books and it's demonstrated time and time again that a Padawan just isn't equipped to deal with the death of what is essentially their parental figure. They live under a code that says they shouldn't mourn their deaths and instead should be thankful they've connected with the spiritual force, which if someone said that to you in real life you'd probably punch them. But beyond internal conflict and struggle, these books just have some really likeable characters in a totally non-complicated way. My favourite of all the books I've read so far is Into the Dark, the first YA novel. It sticks to a more concrete structure with a smaller cast of characters, primarily a Jedi Padawan called Wreath Silas. Wreath is my precious boy and I love him. He's a Jedi bookworm, someone who'd much rather be studying history in the library than out in the battlefield. It's not that he's a coward or a bad fighter, he's studied hard at that too, he just doesn't particularly like hurting people. And his part of the book is learning to go outside of his comfort zone, that as much as he doesn't like hurting people, he does like helping them, and he can do that much better from outside of the library. Into the Dark also has a cast of non-Jedi characters, the crew of the vessel, Afi Hollow, Leox Jossie, and the best character in all of Star Wars, Geode. Afi and Leox are humans, unknowingly working 
working for a corrupt trading guild. Afi is a rambunctious teenager and Leox is an asexual hippie. More on that later. Geod is a rock. That's not a metaphor, he's a six foot chunk of slate that serves as the ship's navigator. He is actually alive, he's from a species of sentient rocks and if that sounds ridiculous, it is. And that's why he's great. See, the joke of Geod is that he never says anything. He's a rock, he just stands there. But the narration of the books projects the emotions onto him in a way that only makes sense in written media. A character will be crying and the narration will read, Geod remained in stony silence, for he knew that no words could bring comfort to her. But he's a rock, he couldn't talk even if he wanted to. And would you believe it, a bunch of people who've never read the book hate this character. Star Wars is no stranger to hate-dums, but the hate-dum for the High Republic is one of the most annoying because it's purely based on people laughing at concept art and released plot beats they've read online. And I'd show you clips from some of these videos, but it's pointless because they're all just laughing at the concept of a character who is a rock, not realising that the character being a rock is the f***ing joke. And then there's the much, much worse part of the hate-dum, the people who hate the High Republic because it has gays in it. But I don't want to focus the conversation on them. They suck. Instead, why don't I show you where Disney's been hiding all of the gays? The High Republic books are full of delightfully casual representation, that obscurity from the mainline Star Wars content allowing them to do so much more than two seconds easily edited out for Chinese markets. The Supreme Chancellor's son has a gay romance with the Prince of Togruta. Some pirates accidentally kidnap a queen's wife because they both use the title queen, which is both sweet and hilarious. Then there's Leox Jossie, who's some genuine asexual representation which we only get once in a millennia, and we know he's asexual because he tells this in the most awkward shoehorned way imaginable. And I would play a clip, but Audible doesn't have a word search function and after scrubbing through for half an hour trying to find it, I give up. But trust me, there's a scene where he just flat out says it in an inappropriate context and it's really weird. The thing is though, I get why they did it that way, because being asexual is a small part of his character. It's not an unimportant part, it doesn't form who he is, but for the most part he's an eccentric hippie with a big heart and a whole bunch of quips. The book's author is quoted as saying about Leo give 1990s Matthew McConaughey a spaceship and see what happens. Not all of the representation in these books is perfect, but it's an earnest attempt and a hell of a lot more than anything the movie shows or cartoons are doing. It plays into the strengths of the High Republic. One of my biggest problems with the Disney era of Star Wars is this constant nostalgic recycling. The more the new things they make are poorly received, the more they lean on old characters and old story threads to keep people watching. The High Republic, with its 200 year distance from all that baggage, has a chance to tell truly fresh and engaging stories within the Star Wars universe. Yes, we've still got Jedi and Force and lightsabers and hyperdrives, but without the baggage of all those old characters and places, the writers are free to do different, more interesting things. In all the books I've read so far, they've not once gone to Tatooine. Can you even imagine? Even the aesthetic of the High Republic is fresh and different. I love the Jedi design in this era, it's easily my favourite. All the white and gold. That's what the prequels are missing, gold trim everywhere. Some people say that Star Star Wars is creatively bankrupt, that the universe is played out and should just be put to rest. I used to be one of these people. But High Republic has proven me wrong. Star Wars can still capture the imagination. We can still tell stories in this interesting sci-fantasy setting. If you've never heard of it, or have only heard brief rumblings that it's bad and not worth getting into, then I hope I've been able to convince you to give it a chance, to delve into some of the most interesting Star Wars content in years. This would be a great place to plug an Audible sponsorship, but I don't have one. The interesting part of the show. That's interesting. I do not care about Sid the Lizard in her nightclub. I don't care about the Bad Batch and their mercenary work. Nor I. However, I did like them getting involved in the Resistance briefly. The Rebellion, I guess. The founding days of it. Even though they weren't a part of it, they just kind of aided the people who were going to be.